Welcome everybody to the Rowan Resource Podcast. My name is Travis Carter, and my guest today is Mike Purser. Mike is a veteran coach who has worked with athletes at every level of competition. In 2018, he retired from an incredible 42 year career coaching at St. Catharines Rowing Club and Brock University. He is recognized in the rowing community as one of the foremost authorities on rigging and his book, Notes on Rowing, Rigging, is a fixture on many coaches' bookshelves. More recently, you can find Mike continuing his efforts to advance education in the sport through his website, perseverance.ca, where he offers camps, clinics, custom rigging services, and frequent in-depth stroke analyses for those that follow his work on the Rowing Perseverance Facebook page. I'm looking forward to diving into these subjects and more with Mike today. And on that note, Mike, thanks for joining me on this podcast. Well, thanks very much for inviting me, Travis. Oh, my pleasure. Um, you know, to kind of kick off, I was thinking um, just to kind of start with some of the basics. And in my own coaching and consulting work through TTS Rowing, I find that there are consistent themes for me to address when I start with new athletes, be it uh, how to complete an effective UT2 session or how to sit on the seat and establish effective body angle and a couple others. I'm curious if there are similarly ubiquitous, but fairly easy to address rigging mistakes that you see when you begin to work with new clients. Um, yes, I think so. I think that's true. Uh, and most, uh, and, and the most common is uh, where to, where to uh, adjust your foot stops. How do you adjust mm -hmm. your foot stops when you get in the boat? Really basic, um, knowledge that coaches and athletes need to, uh, to have when they first start rowing. Definitely. And what, uh, do you find that they tend to kind of err on one toward one direction or another, or what, what is the mistake that you see and how to generally fix it? Do they turn um, tend to go too far bow, too far stern? You know, what is that? Both. Okay. And uh, um, the error, they, they uh, uh, go one way or the other. But um, what they really should be looking for is that finish position, that biomechanical finish position with the hands at the finish. Um, yeah, most, most might go too far um, with the feet too far to the bow. Uh, and that really changes the stroke position and, and effectiveness, especially for, for new rowers that need that connection at the front end. Yeah. And I'm curious your insights for me in that foot stretcher position, I kind of evolved that, you know, and I'm certainly when I'm teaching a brand new crew, you know, it kind of evolves with skill, um, and kind of personal preference to some degree, you know, I know when I have novices, my first priority is just that they can get out of the release comfortably and that we're working really on the mechanical side of things. And then as we start to kind of get the basics mechanically, then we'll start to kind of introduce a little bit more of the dynamics. And so I'll purposely start them, you know, in this first week or so, maybe the first couple of days, you know, with that stretch a little bit extra to the bow so that they can kind of tap out clean. They're not getting that, that stuck. And then as they develop the that mechanical efficiency and they're getting that muscle memory, then we'll start to kind of move them into bow. Um, because, you know, certainly if they're too far to bow, they're not getting, you know, a nice pocket behind the oar. They're not going to feel that acceleration. But, you know, when I first put a novice in the boat, obviously they're not, most of them aren't going to be connecting at all, you know, in the first place. So, you know, putting them forward, isn't going to help them. It's just going to hurt them. But as I do start to kind of see them, you know, almost to where they like start to, if it looks like they're spending the wheels, then we'll kind of start pushing them so that you do have, you know, a little bit of load, you know, and I'm curious kind of your insights on kind of that strategy. If you feel when you feel it's appropriate to really kind of push that stretcher forward and utilize kind of the, the connection in that pocket behind the oar to provide a, a good release versus an athlete that may not be accelerating very well in the water. It's going to get stuck anyway, whether it's better to kind of, you know, ensure they're comfortable and develop the mechanics or to try to force them into place where if they do get a good stroke, you know, they'll have that acceleration, they'll have that pocket and they can pop out cleaner. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting thoughts. Uh, Travis, when I do um, uh, coaching clinics uh, specifically on rigging, I ask the uh, audience usually, uh, what do you think is the most important dimension of rigging? Mm -hmm. And you get a variety of answers. And, uh, and then I suggest that my belief is that the most important dimension of rigging. Oh, and then I ask them the question, uh, um, uh, or then I suggest it's the one you let them adjust every day. It's the one you let the ad athletes adjust every day. And then they, um foot stops oh stroke position and uh and i do believe stroke position is the most critical dimension of uh of uh 
uh, rigging that we can uh, that we can play with. Um, you made a lot of good points. Um, you know, whether the, if they're too far, the footstops are too far to the bow, the oar gets dragged out and it's not clean. Uh, and uh, conversely, uh, too far to the stern. And they do have trouble because the boat is still accelerating. So it's finding that sweet part, sweet spot in the finish. Um, that's just the right time, as you say, where the pocket forms behind the blade and they can get out nice and clean. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, can maybe hop to a little, you know, more advanced thought that I had in a note for later, but in terms of individual needs on that end and kind of going from the, what may be a rule or way, way maybe true for 80% of the population and then finding where it's kind of not the case and where people can break that rule. And one, one athlete that's already always stood out to me is, you know, with Michelle Garrett, the U S single scholar and what Charlie Budd had done with her and essentially moved her very you know, much farther toward the stern. And he talked about this a little bit and they really kind of cut out the release looks totally different than a typical kind of draw through of the elbow. You know, the release, you know, is much farther forward. And I've heard Charlie, I don't remember where it was, but talk about how, with Michelle's, you know, personal characteristics, how they found it was just way more effective to get that extra work through the front end and just sacrifice the back end. And I'm curious, kind of with you and your experience, you know, when is it appropriate for a coach to start to see that or what should they be looking for to say that, you know what, I need to kind of deviate from the rule or what standard for this particular athlete in the boat? Um, well, the really, <clears throat> the really advanced level, uh, coaches uh, and Travis are going to have um, access to some scientific um, um, scientific measuring equipment and uh, what we're what you're trying to do is uh, uh, take the have the finish right where it's it just before it's biomechanically ineffective and the acceleration of the boat is uh, the boat is still accelerating at a high degree and uh, where it just starts to stop that high level of acceleration um that's when you have to uh um that's when you have to have the finish and so adjusting the footsteps adjusting the stroke position is just uh part of that uh can you see it without measuring hard to maybe um uh, a lot of um experienced uh, level coaches can um but it's uh it's much easier when you're when you're measuring uh, acceleration or speed and, and you can really see where that finish should be. And within a boat, do you find, you know, how important is it to, I've seen coaches where it's very standard in terms of where they're putting those stretches within a boat, you know, regardless of kind of the dimensions of their athletes and the, and the flexibility of athletes, you know, hopefully the technique of the athletes is fairly standard. Um, you know, I've heard people talk about, you know, the importance of kind of getting that catch angle aligned. You know, I've heard people with equal vigor talk about the release angle. It tends to, my, my observation tends to be that most people will emphasize the catch angle for faster boats and the release angle for slower boats when they're trying to bring a crew together. What's, do you have any insights on that in terms of what's better or, or you know, starting from maybe a lower level, a novice coach entering their first spring season versus, you know, how that might evolve through the higher levels? Well, the, the novice coach is, uh, what's important in rigging, I think, is that uh, um, the oars go in and out together. I think we all agree on that. And, um, and the novice coach is, of course, uh, working with uh, his shorter athletes to uh, lengthen, to get them a little more reach, a little more layback, whatever it takes. As the, as the, uh, as the crew advances and... Um, and there's still limitations of, of um, stroke length. Um, uh, coaches will adjust the rigging to, uh, to, to make sure they go in and out together. Timing is, is at the catch, but rigging helps the timing at the finish uh, for more advanced level athletes that haven't been able to make a physical change. Um, I, I like to see the catch angles the same. Uh, I like to see them going through the uh, the center of the stroke, the oars going through the middle part. Uh, that's where the real peak force is, but it doesn't have to be exactly at the same time. And um, uh, I'm not so concerned about finish angles. I'm more concerned about finish timing. Okay. Yeah. 
Interesting. And then in one of your videos on YouTube, which I definitely recommend people to go check out that series, but you had, you were talking about the, um, what was the term? The, well, the relative position, of, a relative amount of time in front of the pen versus behind the pen. And you were finding that, you know, you had mentioned about 66%, you know, in terms of work in front of the pen. And, you know, can you clarify, is that, is that work in front of the pen? Is that our distance in front of the pen? Is that time in front of the pen? Do they come out to be about the same thing? And I've seen that 66 in other places before. How universal is that? Is that across all boats? Is that across all athletes? And where is that number coming from? That, uh, <clears throat> that number is, um, so I videotaped at the world championships uh, from 2016 to 2019 and uh, the top, um, the top, the A and B finals, and then uh, correlated all the uh, uh, video and, and taking it through the video analysis that I do. Um, the 66% is a measure of the time that the OR is, if 100% of the time was from when the OR is fully buried to when the OR is, is starting to uh, be extracted from the water and moving, with this, moving at the same direction as the boat, if that's 100% of the time, then 66% of the time is the time between when it's fully buried and when the ore is perpendicular. I, I don't have, of course, you don't have any measuring equipment on uh, boats at the World Championships, but you certainly can video and analyze that video. 66% uh, is, um, is the average uh, of uh, the single scholars, the heavyweight single scholars, men and women, Plus or minus a, a couple degrees, but we find that about two thirds uh, are um, 66% of the time before they get to the perpendicular with their oars. Gotcha. And um, in terms of measuring the type, drive time, you also have some videos kind of talking about that and kind of how that might vary through mm -hmm. different boat classes. I'm curious, one, as a coach on the water, you know, when I was measuring drive time, usually visually, I would measure, I would look more to the athlete than the oar. You know, I would look toward, you know, kind of when the, you see the muscles kind of take the load, you know, and that kind of changing dynamic between, you know, an unloaded body and the loaded body timing from that to the moment of the release and the feather. And, you know, when you're, when you're sitting there and you're stop watching, you know, it's, you know, it's never going to be the same. Let's assume that, you know, the rowers are rowing the exact same stroke. I'm not going to time it the same every time, but, uh, you know, for that drive time for a coach, that's just in the launch. They don't have that recording software to kind of, you know, get that set up and capture the exact time. What, um, what recommendations do you have in terms of looking at that, that drive timing it, you know, do you have a different strategy for timing it on a stopwatch? And then also, is how is that drive time changing between what you're looking at between a single at race pace, a single at training at different energy zones, whether it's, you know, category five, category six, or UT one, UT two, depending on how you're calling it, or an eight rowing similar training categories versus racing, you know, what are, what should people looking at for that drive time? Cause I know I certainly found it helpful for trying to decide one if some rowers were just, you know, the longer rowers were just rowing length that they didn't need or behind kind of the shorter tapier rowers, or if the boat was just rig too heavy or too light. Interesting, Charles. I had the opportunity to uh, work well, in 1982, work with Alan Rosenberg, who was, uh, was working for Royal Ontario at the time uh, as an apprentice coach. Alan was hired as a master coach for a number of us and I had the opportunity to sit on the, uh, the banks of the uh, Henley Island during the Henley Regatta. And uh, we sat there and he, and as the boat, the races would go by, he would say, Mike, look at that crew that rigged too heavy. Oh, I, I looked and, oh, here's a crew that's rigged too light. And here's a crew that's rigged just right. And, and the more we sat there chatting, it was about, um, about the oars just whipping through the water and the boat not moving as much. And then the, the crews that of course were rigged too heavy the oars would go in the water and they'd seem to stay in the water a long time and the boat would have not as much movement. And they, and the, uh, the boats he pointed out to me that um, were rigged well, oars go in, boat goes by, oars come out in the same place. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you, 
you start to look and after a long time coaching, you can develop that eye and say, this is effective. Uh, this is an effective drive time. I, I started measuring it with my stopwatch after that, because um, I wanted to know uh, what it was and where my crew was most effective. And um, the number of years I coached lightweight eights, uh, I could always get them around in at racing pace about 0.63 seconds. And I knew if they were over 0.73, just with my stopwatch, and I would hit the stop, hit the start, hit the um, split, glance down, hit the start again at the uh, um, catch, and hit the split when it was out on the uh, on the feather, and do that about three or four times, and you get it. You're you're within. Once you get used to it, you can be within uh, four or five hundreds, and um, and and I noticed that. Um, um, I'd feel comfortable that this was good rhythm. This was good ratio. And, um, and then, um, uh, and bring my boats appropriately. If it was too long, it was over seven tenths of a second. I'd lighten the load. Um, eights, eights generally, uh, row, uh, the drive time is, uh, just over six tenths of a second. Whereas singles, uh, is uh, the drive time is typically about, um, uh, eight tenths of a second. And there's some leeway there. Um, they're certainly outliers, but uh, in general, the um, the uh, um, standard deviation uh, is only probably 0.3 or point, 0 0.03 or 0 0.04 of a second. Um, so they're all fairly close. And is that uh, you were talking about the difference between you know singles, eights, uh, single, and I'm curious if there's similar differences between male and female athletes. Uh, yes. Yes, there are. Uh, women's eights are uh, have a little bit longer drive times, typically or generally. Uh, but we've seen um, eight, women's eights with very uh, quick drive times as well. But generally, the average is a little bit longer uh, in all women's boats, whether it's the single or the. And I'm talking about three or four tenths, or three or four hundredths of a second. Okay. From the from the data that I've been able to extract, and now. You know, the vast majority of people in the sport, I don't know what the uh, proportion of the audience is, but the vast majority of the people that are rowing these days are indoor rowers, you know, not uh, rowing on the water, you know, and how do you see that translate from the water to the erg? Is it similar uh, times that you're looking for? You see, let's assume that the single is, is transferring. Is uh, Are you seeing that trans or direct transfer? Is there a little difference there? Uh, this is this is an interesting question. Um, I often talk to coaches, and and uh, we often talk about the the uh, the um, um, drag factor. And uh, if if we if we look at specificity of training, we say that uh, the muscle for I for the optimum training effect, the muscle should contract at the speed that it will contract in competition, or or uh, and so. Um, um, the ergs are generally heavier than the boat uh, and take much longer uh, in in uh, the drive time in the in the drive part of the stroke, and um, and I always recommend to coaches that they set the damper. Obviously, lightweights um, who don't have the power of heavyweights uh, need to have a much um, a much lighter uh, uh, setting so that they can get that quick contraction those quick contractions with the muscles. That's interesting that, you know, you talked about the importance of the drive time, maintaining the drive time of the race. Uh, drag factor has been a big subject in my own kind of exploration of training methodology. And it's, you know, a number, a topic of a number of the videos that I have on my personal channel uh, under Travis Gardner uh, on YouTube. Um, I find that I train athletes a lot different than drag than the typical, you know, most notably is that uh, the the drag factor is going to be different for different training zones. Um, yes. You know, I know a lot of, a lot of people just say, you know, here's your drag factor. You're going to do it, whether you're doing a, you know, time trial or whether you're doing steady state, um, which I never really bought into. And for me, kind of in my early career, you know, I looked outside of the sport of rowing for a lot of kind of uh, methodology and ideas and certainly looking at cycling and looking at how gearing was used in cycling and how that was, how, you know, how prevalent changing that gears was, you know, even within a, a given training session, you know, much less training different energy zones. 
and translated that and experimented to that way a lot with my own. I, I would say like, I, you know, I, I wish, you know, I could have taken my you know brain and transported back to coach myself, but uh, you know, most of what I had an athlete, you know, funny, it was like, Oh, you, you know, how did, how did your training work for you when you were doing it? I was like, dude, I didn't, I didn't know any of this when I was training. I was my Guinea pig, you know, I figured it out. And uh, with drag factor was one of them. And I was kind of reading Chris Carmichael stuff and seeing what Lance was doing at the time on the bike. And, uh, you know, and trying to understand steady state, you know, uh, how people were talking about long, slow, steady state and trying to kind of reconcile that with rowing and, you know, eventually realize that, you know, you got to approach aerobic training a lot different in rowing as a power endurance sport than in a muscular endurance sport. But I spent a lot of time with drag and I would, I would try to replicate that spinning of the bike on the erg where I would, you know, the drag would be really low. So I'd put it, you know, 60 something, 70 something. So I'd have to put paper on the flywheel and I'd spin it like a 28, you know, uh, stroke rate and basically just kind of tap like you went on a bike. I'd do that for an hour and a half, two hours, you know, and just kind of see, and you know, the, the kind of summary of that was, uh, I felt like I was an aerobic monster. And then I went to do a time trial and I had no juice because I had basically lost in all of the power, you know, while I was developing this great aerobic engine. But that kind of started me off and, and kind of using drag a lot more in my stroke. And it, and it tied back to this concept that you mentioned, which is the importance of training the drive time that you want at race pace. You know, and I think that neuromuscularly, the, the legs are very sensitive to speed. Um, it's a lot harder for the muscles to, to uh, fire faster, the legs to go down faster than what they're used to, where it's very easy for them to go down slower than what they're used to, you know, if it's at a, if it's at a, uh, certainly if it's at a higher drag and that principle, I pulled that into training with drag factor. And so, you know, you know, for myself, let's say, for example, you know, when I was training, you know, I was, you know, mid six twenties, you know, as a lightweight athlete. And so my race drag was around 118. steady state drag tended to be, in the high eighties, you know, maybe the low nineties, depending on what time of the year it was, you know, UT one drag tended to be around hundred, maybe 95, but pretty consistently at hundred, you know, AT and transport tended to be somewhere between 108 and 116 on the drag. And, you know, that's trying to get this idea that if you, if you take a consent, let's say I took that 118 drag factor, let's say I'm rowing a 36 for 2000 meters on the erg and if you calculate the drive time of that, let's just, let's assume it was 0.65. If I take that drive time and I keep that drag of 118 and I bring that stroke rate down to, let's say an 18, then if I'm rowing that 18 at that drive time at that same drag, then I'm going to produce, be not pre-producing a UT2 sustainable split. I'm actually going to be faster, you know? And so, um, in order to bring the split down to what was sustainable for UT2, um, I didn't want to bring the effort per stroke down because you want to be working hard at UT2. And I, you know, brought the drag factor down so that I could keep that same quick drive, you know, and the split would come up to where it was a sustainable place. And that kind of evolves through the UT1 training zone, the AT and the transport. I'm curious if, if your own experience kind of tracks with that or what your insights are into that kind of those that methodology, that practice, you know, if it, if it makes sense, if you see errors in that, or if it kind of resonates with what your own experience has shown you. No, I, I totally agree. Um, we do training and I used to do, uh, uh, um, uh, strength training, power training on the ERG. And, uh, we would crank up the, we would crank up the drag so that, uh, it was really hard and you would do pieces specifically with uh with additional drag and uh uh to train that sort of that energy system that part of the uh that part of the body and i also believe that uh, uh like you say you have to train at a higher contraction right you know you have to do those sprint training and um so that uh um there there are times when you when you uh, adjust drag factors to um to target different parts of the muscle or different sort of um, um, uh, uh, neurological systems for uh, that they can um, um, uh, start the muscle working the way you want it to. Yeah, no, I agree with, I agree with what you're uh, suggesting. I'm curious, and I've always, this has been kind of a beyond my 
mathematical skill level, but I've always had this idea that there is a, you know, water is a consistent in terms of the properties of water and it's just how much movement water can resist before you start to slip in that water. If you have an idea of what I'm saying about how quickly can the move, you know, or move through the water where it's still connected, it's still forming that mound versus if you're moving it too fast, it's going to, you know, you know, it's going to slip through the water. It's going to wash out per se. And if somebody could take that, that coefficient, whatever that, that is, and then try to determine what the appropriate rig and drag factor is for any given stroke rate for any given power, you know, it's kind of been like, man, if, if I could just like reach out to some MIT guy, maybe if there's some MIT guy, listen to this or some Caltech guy, listen to this, that, that can understand what I'm trying to, you know, explain in my very layman's terms of knowing what that, what that maximum resistance of the water is, you know, and then really trying to kind of get that ideal, uh, rig and that, you know, whether it's, you know, the span, the length of the, or the inboard, whatnot, you know, with the, the ability, the drive length, you know, the, the power of the athlete to get that ideal. So maybe that's a hundred years of technology in the future, but <laughs> um, well, I, I think, I think that, uh, um, that one of the biggest factors in rigging or one of the biggest variables is rowing technique. Mm-hmm. And so we, we, we measure drive time, but the drive time, as you say, is maybe not, um, as, uh, as it may be not the density of the water, but the movement of the oar in the water, if the, if the oar goes, uh, has vertical movements, um, uh, it doesn't act like a real anchor because the water will slip over the, the water in front of the blade will slip over the top or the bottom of the blade itself. And when it does that, it's not really locked in. So your rowing technique uh, is a major factor. And if you can have consistent blade depth, uh, the water, the oar does move in the water. It moves away from the boat and then back to the boat uh, on the, in the last half. And, and the, the water, um, it should move off the, the tip of the blade uh, in the last half of the stroke or the, or the heel of the blade in the first half of the stroke. And that allows the blade to get that maximum connection. Vertical movement is produces slip. Uh, and so um, the connection with the water, like you say, is critical. And, uh, um, uh, but it's the rowing technique that's really uh, going to give you the big advantage. Uh, and of course the rest is exactly uh, right. It's the loading, what's the span, what's the, What's the outboard? What's the inboard? What's the power you're putting on the handle? And how does that relate to the, the, the size, the area of the blade that, that is uh, the anchor, the, the fulcrum that, um, that sort of moves with the water at, at the same time? Right. I'm curious on that, on that blade depth, you know, you hear, I hear a couple of different things with blade depth and I've even heard, you know, differences and ideal blade depth for the shape of the blade that you're using and what your insights have been on that. You know, for me, it's, you know, I, you know, certainly with my athletes, you know, to kind of help them understand that I'll, you know, I'll have them let go of the oar and I'll, they can let it float in the water. And I'll be like, but that's what you get for a $400 oar. It knows what it's supposed to do, you know, in the water. So, you know, stop messing it up and, you know, just move it horizontally. It's got the blade has the vertical component taken down uh, as long as you get it in the water uh, in the first place. But, uh, you know, have you found, you know, with that blade depth, you know, is it good if you do let it float? Is it floating at the right depth? You know, should it be a little bit lower than where it would naturally float on its own? You know, and is there a difference in where people want to carry that blade depth for the different blade shapes? You know, let's assume that we have a round blade, a, a fat blade, or, a, you know, a standard um, standard big blade. Well, I've seen thousands of videos now and, and looked at the speed curves and, um, and what I see that is most beneficial to the speed, to the acceleration, is that uh, the blade depth just under the water, whatever type of blade it is. Mm-hmm. Um, blades that go too deep at the catch, that's just hundreds of seconds to go that extra eight inches deep that um, where the blade is slipping through the water because it's moving vertically. And uh, how long does it take to go? Two, three hundredths of a seconds to go that extra depth. And when you say 
oh, I'm losing that three hundredths of a second of a um, uh, of a second in two hundred and forty strokes. That's huge. Um, so, and 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 uh, uh, um, similarly, coming into the finish of the stroke, the, the um, athletes I see that row deep, they have to take their blade out of the water. And as soon as they're coming into the finish, and the blade starts to come shallow, so they can release clean. As soon as the blade starts to come shallow again, it loses connection, and you see that uh, loss in speed. Just the speed tapers right off. The acceler acceleration goes right down to zero, and the last um, foot of handle pull is, is zero acceleration of the boat. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. just under just under the water surface, horizontal as possible. Um, and the the cavity will form only in the last quarter, last third, the last quarter of the stroke. That cavity will form. Before that, it there's no cavity. It's it's a hump. The blade, the water is just sort of humped up, but uh, but there's no breakage in the surface. And is that a matter of uh, boat speed or handle speed or combination of both? You know, of why it forms later, or does it just take time to form? Um. I, I think that's uh, uh, interesting. It forms, I think it forms just as the boat increases speed and, uh, and it's, it's uh, as it's moving back towards the boat, as, it, as the blade rounds the um, pin and starts to move back towards the boat, of course the boat is moving faster in the forward direction and the blade is moving in the in the opposite direction because the blade is now coming in towards the boat and so i think that's where that that cavity starts to form probably the depth has a little bit of uh, um, uh, consideration with that as well and i'm curious you know on that topic of the cavity there's a there's a couple of drills that that are common in rowing that drive me crazy that i'm not a fan of and i'm you know they have to do with the pocket you know, uh, behind the blade at the release, you know, one being a pick drill and the other being a square blade rowing, kind of starting with square blade rowing. I'm interested in your insights. You know, I've always shied away from square, square blade rowing um, because I feel like for the majority of athletes, unless you're starting to get to a really high level that the really not going to have the, the, the power, the strength, the, even the skill level to, to get a big enough pocket to get a really clean release with square blade rowing. And so I always, uh, will go with quarter feather rowing instead, just to give them that little bit of extra time to kind of clear, clear the collapse of the pocket, clear the water, uh, because I feel like low skill rowers that are rowing a lot on the square blades, they tend to develop that just very harsh, you know, uh, release instead of letting go of the water, they're, you know, jamming the blade out of the water. Um, you know, is that, you know, is that kind of a, you know, something I'm losing on the coaching side? Is that kind of a principle that you would agree with and you would kind of take into your own coaching? Yes, the, uh, I do agree that the, the drill square blade rowing it imparts a movement that is totally different from the movement of the oar handle when you're racing or when you're rowing and you're rowing normally. When you're rowing normally, the, part, the, uh, the blade, when it, when it gets to your body, is the same level as when it leaves your body, and um, and the the um, um, extraction is done on the drive or as part of the drive before you get to the finished position, mm -hmm. and then that, the hands go straight out. So that although um, it does help athletes um, with a vertical movement and be aware of a vertical movement, um, it's it's more of um, I think it's it's further away from rowing than we when we really think, and I, I don't do a lot of square blade rowing uh, at all, and um, um, be, because it is so removed from the actual rowing technique, it, we don't pull in high and tap down. It's not it's not the movement that's seen in racing uh, and uh, or or normal rowing. Um, so it is a drill that I use sparingly. And, you know, I want to spend a little extra time on that because, you know, I, I could comfortably say, you know, 80% of, you know, club row and coaches, certainly high school row and coaches, 
think that you need to be tapping down at the release. Can you kind of expand on that a little bit to try and clarify exactly what's happening at the release? Because, you know, even, you know, for my work right now, I'm doing a lot of remote coaching, uh, you know, if, uh, younger athletes sometimes will come to me if their um, their teams don't have, you know, off seasons or if they just want to supplement or if they're just not getting the, the technical coaching that they need. And, you know, and a lot of them will come and they're just like, well, shouldn't I be pushing my handle down? And certainly at the ERG, I'm like, I definitely don't want you doing that on the ERG. Um, cause that's, uh, it's not the kind of muscle memory we want to kind of develop there. Um, but, uh, you know, so let's dive into that. Maybe try to explain a little bit, clarify for those, for those coaches out there that, that do believe that they need to be tapping out of the release. What's really happening there? What should we be teaching instead? So the path of the R handle is, um, your hands, you're in the finish, your, your legs are down, your body. Uh, it, the torso is, is laying back and you're finishing the last part of the drive, uh, starting the release. And um, the closer those hands and uh, can be to your body with the blade fully buried, the longer the, the drive part of your stroke. And, um, you know, if you, can, if you can pull the hands in um, to uh, 12 inches from the from the body before you start to bring them down and release the blade out of the water uh can you pull those hands in 10 inches to the body or eight inches to the body before your blade starts to release and um uh, but inevitably you're you're pulling the hands down um uh at some point and so you get to the finish position and the blade is feathered you're laying back, your arms are back. Finished position is a finished position. And if you go backwards and forwards from that, you'll see that there's an arc in the hand, the handle, the, the blade, the arc, the uh, handle will be in an arc down towards um, probably, probably your navel, somewhere close to your navel. And then the blade is fully feathered. And from there, it just goes directly forward to the, towards the stern. Um, at a, at a horizontal level. And um, so there's no, there's no uh, um, basketball turn. There's no, it's a, it's a concept, I guess we teach or we suggest to, to novices. Uh, hands go in and they're lower coming out, which is true. As they come in, they start to go down. As they hit the body, they, and the blade is feathered, they don't continue to go down. They go, they go horizontally away from the body. Right. And uh, um, I, I don't know if that fully explains the, the uh, movement of the uh, hands at the, uh, in the release, but, but it is, if you track it in slow motion, definitely uh, um, the path of the blade, the path of the oar handle. Yeah. And I think, you know, the second part there, you're talking about the, you know, as once we have a fully photo blade that the hands are moving away from the body and not down, that's another, we talked about at the very beginning, kind of ubiquitous errors that I'll see in athletes when I get them. And a lot of them are artificially pushing those hands down, you know, dragging over the, the thighs, you know, and, uh, you know, it's really, I tell them, you know, follow the chain, you know, let the handle follow the chain away from the body when you're on the erg, you know, whatever, wherever that handle, that chain is five inches away. That's where you're trying to hit. Um, but even, you know, with novices, I do, you know, I will teach kind of come in, I'll make sure that their elbow comes in horizontally stationary and they can kind of tap down through the forearm to kind of get that extraction. But I think, you know, for myself, as well as a lot of coaches out there, you know, we'll coach an extreme version of something and then allow it to naturally smooth itself out. You know, and I, I, I think that's, that might be an issue with a lot of the, the coaches that are out there that believe in that tap down is that they they don't understand that concept of, of coaching, coaching exaggeration. And there's a lot of exaggerations that I coach, you know, in my rowing, uh, certainly I like to coach early square up and practice, you know, it's something that naturally disappears at the, as a break was higher in a race rate. You don't have to think about it or do it. It just happens. But if you have rowers that square up late all the time, then they're usually going to miss water, you know, when the rate goes up, whereas if I have athletes that are always squaring up early, you know, in steady state that they tend to kind of naturally blend, you know, that being one, you know, of the hands coming away, I'll tend to teach that, you know, athletes to carry their, their hands a little heavier through the middle of the recovery, you know, when they're doing low rate stuff, get a little extra clearance of the blade, you know, cause I know that when they're racing, their blades aren't going to be up and down, they're going to flatten out on their own, you know, and that as well, I can see kind of, 
you know, coaches teaching these athletes kind of get that tap down to get that extraction and then not really following up with the fact that that isn't the ultimate goal, you know, and coaches kind of take in to their own uh, training, you know, certainly I don't know how it is in Canada, but in the U S I mean, there's a lot of coaches that hop into the sport and they're chosen for their, for their leadership and enthusiasm and not their technical expertise. And so they might just not have reached a level where they understand, um, that evolution of training. Um, let's talk about my least favorite drill. I hate the pick drill. I hate everything about the pick drill. <laughs> I hate how much people like the pick drill. And I want to talk about why I hate it. And I, I want to get your insights on it. And so one, um, with that release, you still get that kind of, you know, forceful blocky release because you don't have enough time necessarily to get a pocket, you know, behind that blade to get a nice clean release. So unless you're going really low pressure, really low speed, I, I feel like there is a, you know, a, um, distortion of the release, you know, motion when you're doing that pick drill, but more importantly, I think it destroys how you connect with the water at the front end. And so you're kind of changing the dynamic of how you connect, you know, if you're not, if your blade isn't, you know, at, a, I think it was, you know, an angle in the sixties at the, at the front end, that's a very different feeling of the, of the catch and how you pick up the water, how you pick up the boat than it is if you're anything shorter. And I do see value in rowing doing half slide rowing and doing three quarter slide rowing, you know, um, from time to time, but the picture, especially, it just seems like it's, it gets these athletes that one, they're just really harsh at the release. You know, they over swing, you know, for both ends when they're doing their body, suddenly they're swinging 25 degrees instead of 10 degrees, you know, with their body. Uh, and that front end dynamic is just, uh, has to be a little quicker, you know, as it is at half slide or three quarter slide, because your angle is shallower, um, and they'll try to kind of take that into a full, full compressed stroke, which, uh, then gives a very harsh front end. you know, so that's my critique, you know, of why I hate the pick drill and I, I'll only use it at very low pressures for the mechanical, uh, benefit of developing muscle memory, separating the parts. Uh, but I'll do it at low pressure, low speeds, or I'll do it in the tank, but you know, I definitely don't like doing it on the water at, at a normal pressure. So you know, am I right? Am I wrong? Can you empathize? Well, you know? it, it, uh, that's good. And, and I would ask, and you've explained it, but I would ask coaches, why, why do you do that drill? Why mm -hmm. do you do that drill? And if they can, because most drills do not simulate the part of the stroke, do not simulate that coordination of muscles that are involved, the movements, the speed of the boat. There, most drills are far removed from actual rowing. And so, um, if you don't know what you're targeting um, and like the pig drill, for instance, the boat's moving very slow. The, uh, um, the muscles that, that you're sitting, your legs are already flat. So they're not engaged. They haven't been engaged. They're just, they're just connected. Um, the, the muscles that the organization of the muscles that are working together, it's just arms and, uh, um, and, and so you would ask the coach, you know, what are you emphasizing here? And, uh, you know, if they have a good, well, it's, it's really about, uh, extracting the blade from the water. Uh, it's, it's really about this, uh, particular movement or the shoulder position or what it happens to be. Does that link to the rowing stroke? Does that link to the movement of this rowing stroke? And the farther it is, from actual combined movements, speed, uh, neurologic uh, connection with the muscles, um, the further it is from reality, uh, from the rowing stroke, the less you should probably do it. But if you're trying to teach or even challenge the athletes to try something, um, it, it's sometimes interesting, but um, is, it, is it useful? Are you getting, are you going to have a, a better release if you do this drill and then go back to um, regular rowing or racing. And, yeah. and there is the answer, right? If you can say, yes, my release is going to be better. Um, and you can, you can really measure it or see it or, or, or notice then. Yeah, that's a good drill. But um, uh, no, I don't do a lot of pick. We used to always leave the doc doing that pick drill. I ain't crazy. Yeah, crazy. No. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's pick a drill that really is, is, uh, um, creates a lot of, uh, movement in the arms when they're not warmed up, that pools blood in the legs when you're not warmed up, 
Why did we do that? Why did we do that, Travis? I don't know, but that that was uh, um, common for us years and years ago. Yeah, well, hopefully people are listening and uh, maybe it'll kind of snap them out of that habit. But uh, and not not to just kind of poo poo the pick drill and not give an alternative. I don't want to be just a Debbie Downer there, but uh, I just use pauses, you know, when I'm touching novices. And you know, I'll go back as a novice coach. I love coaching novices. I I might love coaching them more than kind of varsity, you know, just because uh, you know how important it is for their development. But uh, we use pick, we use pauses, and so they'll pause the release, pause the arms away, pause the body over to kind of get them to gather and to think about, you know, the separation of those emotions, but kind of the core of that is for me as a novice coach, especially down here in the U S you know, coaches, you know, they get their athletes racing way too soon. They're doing pieces way before they can even row together. Um, and, uh, for me, it's like, I look at a novice year and if I'm one, if you're doing pick drills, you're not really taking full strokes. If I'm doing pause drills, I'm still taking full strokes, you know, at least. And uh, for my novices, it's it's like a, a game. And, and same for reason why I do a lot more aerobic work, you know, with my novices, um, you know, than a lot of my peers who are doing pieces is that I can get more strokes in in practice. And I'm, I look at those novices and I'm like, if I can take somebody, you know, from August to, to May and they take 220,000 strokes, you know, because they're doing pause drills instead of pick drills and they're doing, you know, long aerobic work instead of pieces. And you guys have only taken 130,000 strokes. I'm going to destroy you because I've taken twice as many strokes, even though they might not be as anaerobically conditioned, you know, they're just better, you know, they have more repetitions under the belt. And, you know, so instead of that pick drill, you know, coaches that are listening, you know, do pauses instead, pause it, whatever part of the stroke you want, if you want the athletes to gather. And I think, for that picture, a lot of them do it for timing. They're like, well, I want them to get in their arms moving together, their body moving together. And I was like, well, just have the pause and make sure they all stop at the same time. <laughs> pause at the release. If it's a, uh, you know, if it's a varsity crew, it's, you know, and keep the boat on keel, but uh, yeah, excellent. I'm glad, I'm glad I'm not alone in that. Um, well, Travis, I would, I would challenge you and say, um, and I totally agree. Pause drills are the best. But are you pausing in the positions that are actual positions you would be in during the rowing stroke? Mm-hmm. I.e., yep. for example, um, only a few years ago, uh, coaches used to pause, of course, pause, we call it pause one right in the finished position. This is an actual position of the rowing movement. Mm-hmm. And then they would say pause two is when the arms are away, but you still have the body back. This is not a position in rowing. This is never a position in rowing other than this one drill. And then of course, then the next one would be pause three and you'd rock over and your legs would be straight. Your arms would be forward and your body would be forward and your legs would be straight. And, and again, totally foreign to an actual rowing movement or rowing position. And Mm -hmm. so pause drills are, are extremely valuable if you can match them in the uh, position of, I call the row, I call pause two, pause one at the finish. I call pause two is when your arms or your elbows are like 90 degrees and, and your, your torso is almost at the perpendicular and you're at quarter slide. This is part of the dynamic recovery that I promote and uh, where everything works together. Like it does in racing, everything moves out of the finish together. And, um, um, and this is the, this is the position that everybody's in at, um, at this part of the stroke, when your hands are crossing your knees, your legs are already moving up and your torso is approaching the perpendicular. So and where, at what, at what point in the stroke do you, do you advocate for having you know, the body position established, you know, when is the body done and the, and it's just legs compressing into the front end. Well, how, how experienced is it, is the crew, the, 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 the more experienced the crew, the further you can, uh, you can, uh, continue to swing the body. Uh, what we know is that, uh, um, acceleration to minimize acceleration to minimize deceleration on the recovery, you're pulling the feet towards you and you, you're pulling your feet towards the seat on the recovery and the boat is accelerating. The boat is accelerating um, two thirds of the way of the recovery. 
Um, and if I said, you get, if I said, if that was 66% of the recovery between finished position and full reach, um, the boat is accelerating two thirds, 66%. Can we make that 68%? Can we make that 70%? Can we accelerate that, um, those feet towards that center of mass that the athletes have? Mm -hmm. um, how, how far in the recovery can we do that? And top crews can do that uh, a long time. And part of that is using your torso, using the weight in your upper body. And this is, Travis, now we're talking about elite Pilot. crews, yeah. using that torso in your upper body. So you don't get to that full reach position until um, past three quarters line. Certainly two or three um, slide, I wanna say, I don't wanna say hundreds of a second, two or three frames um, so between, uh, maybe a 10th of a second before you get to the full reach position, your, your, your torso should be at full reach at that elite level, at that, at the, at the level that I'm analyzing these crews, uh, uh from the world championships, that, uh, torso movement is part of the acceleration of the boat. And, um, um, but I, I think th from, I think for the viewers here, if we said three quarter slide, um, make sure you get your up, your torso at full reach position by three quarter slide. I think that would be a good um, um, goal for coaches. And uh, what what skill level do you think at a novice level that's you know you're trying to push it, you get it done earlier? You know, I know for me, it's you know generally the the less experienced they are, the early I'll try to get them set knowing that as rate goes up there, they'll, they'll start to blend a little bit, you know, but I want to establish that, that muscle memory, that, that pattern as much as I can. Um, and it's interesting and in, in talking about the kind of the rhythm is, you know, I don't, uh, I usually don't say this explicitly, even to, you know, some of my varsity athletes, unless they're kind of work training for nationals or Canadian Henley. So higher level athletes, but, uh, you know, we'll talk about that control. I don't, I'm, yeah, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me to see coaches uh, coaching like a, a huge slowing of the body up up through the uh, legs recovery. You know, I usually teach them to just kind of flow it up consistent speed. But I know that you should actually be accelerating up into the front end. Well, that's the last thing I'm going to tell a novice is that, yeah, speed up as you go into the front end. Um, and some of my, some of my more, uh, you know, uh, attuned listeners have kind of picked up on that and asked me questions in the comments of my YouTube videos where they're like, wait, does that mean you're, you accelerate into the front end? I'm like, yes, don't tell anybody, <laughs> don't tell the novices. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I haven't thought about kind of using the body for that acceleration as kind of more of just kind of allowing the boat to kind of move forward. And, uh, you know, and I want to kind of hop on this because there's still a, there's still a big misconception about this in the rowing community as well with a lot of coaches is they think the boat is slower on the recovery, you know, and uh, where in fact the boat is, is much faster on the recovery, you know, than it is on the drive. And I mean, if you can just, you just watch, uh, watch boats on the water, you know, look at the bow movement, you know, when does the bow slow down, you know, the bow is speeding up, speeding up, speeding up, and then it drops, you know, and that it's speeding up all the way through that recovery. Um, but you know, in spite of that, you know, a lot of coaches still think the boat is slower on the recovery. And, uh, fortunately I had about a year and a half of physics, you know, before I got a quantum mechanics and realized that my brain doesn't quite work that way, um, before switching to uh, behavioral psychology to pursue coaching. But, uh, I, I learned enough to understand conservation of center of mass and how that works, you know, and how that, 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 that law, um, ensures that the boat is going to accelerate on the recovery as we compress into the catch, you know, what's the you know, any, any insights into that and kind of, so people can understand why that happens and, you know, to, to know um, that the boat is speeding up through the recovery, it, if you do it right, if you do it right. Yes, yes, yes. And I think we need to, I, my favorite, my favorite, uh, one of my favorite, uh, um, uh, camera shots when I'm watching, uh, the world championships or the Olympics is that shot when the bows seem to be yeah. moving out from one another right <laughs> yeah. and and you and you look at it and you see wow this one bow is really moving out further mm -hmm. like it seems to have more run seems to have more movement and um 
and and why is that and that's and that's the crew that's not that's not slowing down that is accelerating right into the uh right into the next catch mm-hmm. right into the next catch they're accelerating that boat um um until they and until they have to slow down and 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 take that catch uh going back to novices so Travis, I, um you're right uh you don't want it you don't want it. a novice will accelerate into the catch if you let them yeah. and i think the critical part with novices is teaching them not to not accelerate but to start slow mm-hmm. and uh and the difference between uh racing where there's no constant speed on the recovery you're accelerating or you're decelerating into the next catch and the difference between that and training where we say uh where we used to say uh get the hands out pivot con- uh, constant speed forward that we're learning these movements yeah at, at some point we're handicapping these these athletes from understanding that acceleration into the bow and and I think when you start to race, you're you're a novice, and maybe your first year is just fun. The racing isn't a, a serious part of it. But at that second year, when you're when you're starting to teach racing, we have to teach the the dynamic recovery, the hands and and slide and 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 torso all move out of the bow together. In training, they start very slow. The side starts very slow, but it's that first movement. When you first movement out of the finish, the legs are, the knees are raising, tiny, tiny bit. And so if I look at, and I often video crews at, at, at pace, and then I have the coaches come and uh, video the crew at um, uh, training rates, like 20. And then we look at the comparison between training rates and racing rates. And I find that the crews that are really good accelerating the boat on the recovery are the ones that can, at, at, at um, um, practice speeds, hard to accelerate the boat. The goal is to maintain the speed. And to maintain the speed, because at practice rates, the, the recovery is slightly over two seconds long, mm-hmm. 2.2, whatever, depending on the boat and uh, the boat class. Um, so if you have over two seconds to go from the finish back to the catch position, um, and it has to be an acceleration, you have to start. And that's why people are starting really, really slow. And But there is a little bit of acceleration all the way towards that next catch. And, um, um, and that allows athletes to, to learn the concept. I'm, I have a lot of master's camps and I, I, I'm talking to masters about this is you racing and here's where you start to slow down. And here, here's you sitting at what happens if you sit at the finish, the bowl will slow down and you start to move your hands away. There's no pull on the footstops. Make the boat go faster, you either have to pull on the oarlocks or pull on the footstops. No other way. And and they get they start their hands away and they pivot and the boat will just decrease in speed. And then we go through this camp, whether it's a weekend camp or a week-long camp. And, and you say naturally flow out of the finish. Move your hands, body, legs together like it was your first day on the water and you just want to go from this position to this position. It's a natural movement to go from the finish position back to the catch position, put a, put a uh, first guy, put a uh, day one on an ergometer, the athlete will move hands, body, and legs together. Hands will go over the knees. It'll look very awkward. Mm-hmm. But it's it's a natural movement of combining the muscles to go up to the next uh, to go up to the next uh, a catch and um, um, and I think we we need to teach that to novices start slow and then uh, um, accelerate um, <sighs> yeah it, um, accelerates a hard word because when you tell that to novices they they really crash. Yeah. Uh, the front stops. But um, I think this is, I think this is an important skill to learn. 
And it's interesting how you describe kind of, you know, starting that recovery about starting it slow. You know, for me, you know, I, I always talk kind of leave the body at the same speed you came into the body, you know, so especially if you're, if you're rowing slower, it's slower. If you're rowing higher, it's higher. Or a lot of coaches will just say fast hands, fast hands, fast hands. You know, I think that's another, another kind of, uh, you know, lack of understanding from maybe their coaches, you know, where they were rowing at race rate, they had slow hands, they said fast hands, and they assumed that that was a universal thing. Um, so for me, it's kind of like, you know, I'll coach, you know, leave the body at the same speed you came into the body and then allow that natural acceleration into the front end. Do you think you should, do you think that's off? Do you think you should be a little bit more patient from the body? Or is that, is that a correct approach of leave the body at the same speed you came into it? Well, I mean, you're, 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 there's no one speed when you're on a drive, right? You're, you're coming into the body and your hands are slowing, 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 slowing. They stop and then they go in the opposite direction away from the body. Mm -hmm. So they're at zero at some point. And, uh, and the speed they move away um, should be relative, it should allow you uh, when the hands go away, you're already starting up the slide. You're starting to the uh, the torso forward to pivot back forward. So the speed that they go to go away should be in sequence with the other two muscle groups, trunk and legs, and they should um, allow for the acceleration uh, um, of the of the body towards the next catch. Of the of the center mass, the acceleration of the foot stops back towards the body. Yeah, it's a little you know. There's we we simplify that, and I've heard the hands should go away at the speed of the water, the um, and follow the puddles. Uh, I've heard so many different things um, that I've not been able to really wrap my head around. Uh, but it's. Um, uh, it, and it's interesting. I, I, I just think that it has to be a flow, has to be relaxed, it has to be natural, and it has to allow the athlete to, to accelerate, to gain speed, um, which, it, which keeps the boat accelerating, keeps the boat, or at practice rates, at least keeps the boat at the same speed, and right as far as they can towards the next, uh, towards the next catch. Because this is training. This is training for racing. So when you're racing, it's it's all about acceleration. We want to accelerate into the next catch and accelerate as far as we can yeah. so that we can get there. And, um, and to do that in practice, again, it's, it's just reducing the whole uh, level of acceleration to the point where it's acceleration. It's not constant speed. It's positive acceleration. Uh, but it's at a much lower uh, level than in a race. And I'm curious, tying into this, this feel of it, you know, for me, another kind of pet peeve of mine in the sport is kind of the, you know, the marriage to a static erg. And for me, I try to, you know, the, I try to move my athletes onto slides as quickly as possible um, to develop that sense of that dynamic, um, dynamic recovery, you know, and, you know, I, I when I talk to them, you know, I call, you know, when we're rolling on slides, I call it a passive recovery in the sense that, you know, you're allowing the erg to come, you know, whereas active recovery on the static erg, you're physically moving yourself forward. Um, and how alien that, you know, we talked about kind of things that you just don't do, you know, and, you know, on a static erg, you know, you're, you're pulling yourself, you're pulling that body weight forward on the boat. That isn't, that's not an emotion that you want to do. And so, I'm curious in your experience and your insights into this, you know, in terms of the prevalence of using slides, you know, is it, um, do you see it expanding? Is it more of a U.S. thing? Do you see it uh, adopted more, you know, above the border there? Um, you know, do you think that is as valuable as I do in terms of getting athletes that are uh, practicing to roll on the water onto slides or an RP3, if you can afford it, you know, or something along those lines, you know, and getting them off those static C2s? Yes, definitely. I, I definitely support that. And I haven't, uh, I, I haven't worked enough with them, but I, I see the advantage, uh, definitely from a, from a, uh, recovery point of view, but, um, actually more, um, from the front end, uh, to when you take the catch on a, a static erg, 
um, you're moving your entire body, right? When you take the when you take the uh, and there's the force that's going into the footstops is not part of it. It's only what's pulling on the handle, and you're using the footstops. But in a boat on a static guard, when you push on those footstops, you also push on that handle, mm -hmm. not through the body, but through the equipment. In a boat, the force that you apply on your footstops is being applied to the back of the oar lock and the and the oar itself. On static curve, it's on a on a slider, it's the same thing. Whether whether it's the dynamic or the or just a regular uh, uh, um, ergon sliders, and it the big advantage is the catch. It helps you take the catch. Most people that have that that bent arm syndrome at the catch have trained on the on the uh, uh, C two for forever, and because there's because their legs aren't quick enough. Um, and, and they, they just can't pick up that weight fast enough, they tend to bend their arms and that carries back over in a boat. So I would definitely recommend sliders uh, um, for, for everybody uh, that uh, uh, has the opportunity and get away from the static erg. A static erg is great for a workout. For me, I'm not racing, but um, um, it, it's, there's a lot of bad habits that it can teach. Definitely. I'm curious, you know, what you just said there kind of reminded me of my favorite trail being uh front. Well, other than quarter feather, I think, you know, I wrote quarter feather for, you know, weeks and weeks, you know, at the beginning of the season when I'm coming off my transition phase, but uh, the, uh, the front quarter, you know, just front quarter slide kind of tapping along and I'll have my athletes do that on a, on a slides as well. And it really kind of helps them feel that connection, isolate the legs, get the arms out of that, that connection motion. Um, I'm curious if you have favorite drills, you know, that you use on the water, you know, maybe on the erg as well and, and why they're your favorites and, and what you're trying to accomplish with them. Uh, my favorite drill, my athletes would tell you this. We did, we used to do this every, every day. Favorite drill was the stationary catch, right? The roll-ups starting at the finish and, um, um, and just going up the slide blades off the water and, and whenever the blades would touch the water we'd stop you can't you know if the blades touch the water the conxy would just say stop go back set up ready rope and they they tap out and the blades would be all the way off the water and they'd square up and they'd put it in mm -hmm. and then it would evolve to okay not bad let's put it in like we mean it let's put it in like like we're in racing and then we would get uh, acceleration involved. Can we accelerate into the catch and drop it in quick? And then we would add pause, what we would call pause for, pause halfway up the slide. This would teach balance. It teaches the blade approach. It teaches the recovery. It teaches all those, all those things. And my favorite part of the stroke, and I believe the one that is um, the biggest um, benefit, if you can do it right, is the catch. And um, you mentioned it, but um, I used to say to the athletes, the, uh, the catch is made up of two parts. It's made up of the lift and the pull. And these two things happen exactly at the same time, except the lift is first. And then, coach, how can you have something be first if it happens at the same time? And it, and, but that, that drill separates the lift from the pull and it allows them, allows the concept of, entering the water uh, the movement of entering the water without the pull and of course when you can when you can do that have very little leg drive or have no leg drive and get the blade in this really taught and i always thought that that was a um a mark of my crews that you know they would say uh, there goes a there goes an eight oh that my, that's my purser's crew look at those catches they're sharp they're clean they're together and they're in before they're even moving the slide, the blades are fully buried. And that, that was sort of the, the goal that, uh, uh, one of the goals that, so that was my favorite drill. Yeah. And then with pause exercise, I used to love pause exercises too. They taught the balance uh, that I think is so critical and we don't, as coaches, uh, focus on enough. If you can't balance, then um, I used to, 
uh, I had a group a few years ago, uh, a Canada Games group that um, I would say, uh, um, and then we'd be in singles uh, often. And uh, okay, push off. You have to do five roll ups with the blades off the water before you can start your warm up. And they would push off. And of course, um, there'd be dynamic warm up on the water, uh, sorry, on land. But then we they push off, and it would be like total focus on balance. So you get the balance, you get the feel of the boat, the feel of the water, the feel of the wind, the feel of the day, and the balance before you even started rowing, before you even started the on water workout. So um, that uh, balance drills and and um, uh, and those drills they were very very advantageous, I think, for the crews that I coached. I love that. You know, that's, I would generally, I would say that extreme focus on balance to kind of, you know, more kind of my borderline high performance athletes. I always wonder if I should kind of, you know, transfer that focus to earlier in the career. But, um, I, you know, I found one of the better team boats I had was, you know, all scholars, you know, how I was confident enough in the blade work. And we just did a lot of pausing at about half slide, all blades off the water. Um, and then uh, sometimes we do it like I call it pause at knee break. So pause after the knees break, and then we'd pause again, you know, half slide, and just getting them and and square up on that second pause to to f- and we would pause yeah. first, blades feathered, and then I have them square on the pause, and then we have them go. With another thing being, you know, I talked a lot, you know, with the the feathering of the blade is. You know, I talk to the athletes a lot about separating the, your axis motion, you know, so if you have your X axis, you have your Y axis and you have your Z axis, you know, and the big issue with feathering is that people can't rotate through the Z axis without moving around on the Y axis, you know, and so I found that that drill was very helpful to kind of pause, make sure you have the balance square without throwing off the balance, isolate that rotation in the Z axis, and then kind of continue with the stroke and that, that boat, uh, definitely outperformed their, uh, their fitness level you know, on the water and the racing. Cause that yeah, we it. have a uh, Travis in Canada, we have a, a sort of a learning process and it starts with grip. You, know, mm-hmm. you teach the grip first and then you teach posture mm-hmm. and, uh, and then you teach balance and then you teach rowing technique and then you teach uh, power application. And the last thing we teach is, uh, is endurance, is, is longer rows. And uh, whenever one of those stages breaks down, the practice is over or you go back, right? If they, if they don't have the right grip, you can't progress to good posture. And if they don't have good posture, you can't progress to balance. You go back to posture. Here, here let's practice this position at the catch, sitting at the catch, sitting at the finish, the position, the transition between the two. And then, um, so those, those sort of stages, grip, uh, a posture, balance, technique, uh, power application, and then endurance uh, are, are a real sort of outline of where we want to go as coaches and where we can, if something's breaking down and you're, you've lost your, you've lost your posture, either because the athletes have sore backs or, or uh, you, you have to stop at some point and go backwards. And when they, when the, um, in the endurance work, if they can't apply the power, if it's not being applied p- properly, then um, you have to go back. I think that's such a valuable lesson for for coaches and i see it a ton with coaches certainly down here in the u.s is that there's not there there's too much pressure on themselves or from outside to kind of put progress the lessons you know regardless of whether they've kind of mastered the earlier steps you know you'll see you know I, for for me you know the transition one key moments for the novices i think are incorporating the feather into the stroke uh, which I save pretty late, you know, usually I'll do, you know, maybe four to six weeks into the season uh, if I'm taking it slow, depending on how often they're practicing a week. Um, and then once I, you know, I'm comfortable with that, once they've really isolated that Z axis and they're not, that feather isn't messing up their, their blade heights, then, uh, then we'll start adding in, we'll be rowing with a full boat, you know, and I always say, you know, I see 
you know, I, don't, I haven't seen novice races up there in Canada, but you know, down here in the U S there's some pretty horrible things you'll see on the race course in the fall, you know, with, with crews that are rowing. And I, you know, it's unfortunate, you know, I would say, you know, if you're, if you, the first time you add your novices to rowing all eights, you know, if they come out and they're ecstatic, they're like, that felt amazing. I couldn't believe it. You did it right. But 90% of the people are like, and a coach will do it. They're like, let's just row by eight. I want you to see how hard it is, you know? And so to add it in way before they're ready. I, so I thought it was going to flip and I don't know what I hated. That it was horrible. And I was like, well, that's, it's a failure of the coach to properly prepare them for, you know, step, step five, but you know, because you haven't done step three and four appropriately. Um, well, let me, yeah, let me, and, start, let me just support that and say, what wins novice races? Yeah. What wins novice races? Rowing technique. It's totally. not your, it's not your power and your, or your endurance when, when technique is so sloppy and you're not effective mm -hmm. rowing technique wins novice races. And, and that's, and if we, if we're following these steps correctly and you, and, uh, uh, and if a coach, yeah, we're going to row 20 kilometers, even if it's bad technique, we're still going to row 20 kilometers. Um, it, you're either risking injury or you're teaching bad technique, which is going to, hinder your your performance and so uh um yeah i love novice racing too i used to love co coaching novices um yeah fun yeah i'm curious you know if there's what your standard practice is for racing down here in the u.s there's a there's another uh kind of tendency that i can't stand where coaches are like well racing's the fun part you know we got to get them racing as soon as we can i'm just like this is the wrong sport to emphasize racing, you know, where you're spending 95% of your time in the sport training, you know, compared to I was look at like baseball or basketball where it's like, yeah, we're like, we practice like, you know, for a couple hours and we're, you know, spend 10 hours a week, you know, in competition. Um, so yeah, but there's, it persists, you know, coaches will just kind of push them to racing because they think that's what will hook them, you know, and there's just so many crews one that just don't have that technique, you know, for me coming from, you know, my background in behavioral psychology and understanding the importance of muscle memory and repetition, you know, is that you're, it's so difficult to undo a bad habit versus just taking the time to develop a good habit, you know, with those novices. Mm -hmm. And I, and I see that. And it's kind of my one, one thing I would uh, tell novice coaches is just take your time. Don't be in a rush to race. You know, usually for me, we'd race once or twice, you know, usually just once at the end of the fall season. So that's an athlete with usually at least two months of training behind them. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll see, you know, coaches be like, I got my crew rolling by all eight, you know, on day three. I was like, I, I don't know if I'd want to see what that looked like. <laughs> you know, I guess if, if not flipping counts as rowing all eights, I think maybe we have different standards for what that means, but uh, yeah, and they'll be racing three, four weeks in the season. I always look at, I always look at prep school crews down here, you know, and they only row in the spring, you know, they have a full spring of racing 1500 meters within their, their scholastic league, you know, and, uh, you know, there is no novice year. And so, I mean, there's athletes that three weeks after picking up an oar for the first time, they're racing 1500 meters, you know, against other prep school, 10th boats or whatever it is. Um, and I just like, I don't know, how they eventually get rowers to, to that first boat movement. Well, I, I know it's, it's exceptional ability of talent of the athletes, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and not necessarily the coaching, the progression, but, uh, but yeah, so it's a, it's a struggle. And, um, in, in Canada, you talked a little bit about kind of the, you know, the Canadian way of, of teaching and coaching, you know, I'm curious what, what that coaching education structure is in Canada and how it differs from the U S because I know it's something that the U S tends to struggle with and they're, they're trying to get better with it. I, I don't think they're necessarily taking the right approach, but I do know from traveling to St. Catharines a lot, just the, the, the talent and the efficiency of the, the young crews there, you know, were markedly different, you know, than, than the crews down South. Um, I'm curious, you know, what the, now that you're certainly involved in coaching education yourself, and I mean, you've been there the whole time, but what's, what do you feel works well in, in Canada? What are the practices there? And, you know, what do you, you have any suggestions for things that you've observed in the U.S. that we could be better at that? Um, well, our system, our coaching uh, development system really started, in, well, I mean, there's, we've always had different parts and different, but uh, the Coaching Association of Canada, which is uh, 
sort of an umbrella uh, organization for all sports. Um, I believe began in the mid seventies and they promoted uh, each sport and each national governing body to develop their own content. And so where our, um, our content is sort of overseen by, uh, by the Coaching Association of Canada, um, which regulates all the coaching development and, and shares the, the, uh, uh, a lot of the information between sports. I think that's in a big advantage. I'm, 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 uh, I have to be honest, Travis. I, I did use it um, when I was in the States coaching. I did used to uh, teach uh, U.S. rowing uh, uh, coaches course, courses, uh, but um, but I'm not uh, current on on what the uh, uh, what the program is like now. Um, the Coaching Association of Canada and then Rowing Canada developed the content in the '70s. And, uh, and it's kept moving forward, it's evolved, it's changed, it continues to uh, change. We made some recent changes to our, our model technique, which uh, um, uh, was published in 2020. Um, there's, I think, currently four different um, pathways for coaches, those coaching sort of novices, coaches that are, um, and we have what we call um, uh, athletes in different phases uh you know you're learning to train you're learning to compete you're training to compete there's a number of different levels and the coaching um, um workshops and are targeted at those levels and so that uh, uh the focus is not um if you're um if you're a um, um uh, what we call um um lt um learning to row coach, learn to row coach, then you're focused with the athlete in their first year rowing. And you're given the, uh, the, the, uh, the knowledge of what's important at that level. And, um, and it's, it's, it's very rigging. There's some rigging concepts are that are really important uh, at um, um, the first, uh, uh, first level, you know, where to set your feet, uh, how to check the pitch or the orlock height. Um, load who cares they're not racing they're not rowing fast they're just learning to row so there's basic concepts for those levels and uh and i think it works really well the um the le the they're not levels the the pathways that we have and if you start as a, a performance coach then then you sort of skip over those first that first year, how do you teach novices? How do you keep their attention at this level? How do you teach these, uh, these specific skills? Because you're not working with athletes that need to do that. You're working with athletes now that are in the um, training to compete stage. And, um, and, they are, um, and they are, now you're into um, what are you doing at race rate? What are you doing at high rates? What are you doing with rigging now to get the most out of your uh, effectiveness um, of, of the mechanics of the rigging? Um, and then you're into the psychology and, and of course the physiology of the training programs themselves, which at the novice level is, is not, yeah, I mean, practice planning is critical at all levels, but your practice plan at a, learn to row level is totally different from your practice plan at at the uh uh at the performance level so no it's a it's a i think it's an extremely good program right now we have in canada and uh and it keeps and it keeps evolving and now i want to kind of pull back um before we wrap and uh go pull back to the rigging you know and kind of touch on those those concepts and you and we talked about kind of you know stroke position you know Let's talk a little bit about kind of what you learned uh, in terms of, you know, setting effective heights. You know, where you set the position. What what's kind of key key understands that novices need to novice coaches need to know what they should be looking for, and then maybe progress that into kind of varsity level youth uh, coaching as well. And kind of what what people should be prioritizing. What what's not important. You know, you talked about with the novices, the gearing is not so important. You know, kind of understanding what what warrants their attention at certain levels and, and what doesn't. And, and then 
the things that do warrant their attention, what to focus on, you know, what to do in order to kind of get the most out of their crews. And I think my perspective has always been the more comfortable the rower, the the faster they're going to be, the better they're going to perform. And that's always been my priority in, in rigging. And um, there's not too, not too many cases where I can think of myself kind of pushing them out of comfort zone to try to get, you know, performance tweak. So, you know, maybe I'll, I'll start you out kind of for a novice coach, what do they need to be thinking about? What's important for, to ensure that their boat is set up for success. And I know it's hard for those novice coaches because sometimes, you know, unfortunately in the, in the U S on how it is in Canada, but they're really given the crappiest equipment. That's the most difficult to work with, you know, but uh, at least, you know, with the means that they have available, what do they need to focus on? What do they need to do to ensure that their novices are even in a position to, to row well, um, Whereas I think a lot of coaches don't even realize they could be teaching the great technique, but if your boat's not set up, it doesn't matter. They're not going to be able to execute on what you're teaching them. Well, I think uh, that's good. That's a good question. The uh, so novices, of course, you're you're standing with you're starting with a, a standard length oar, right? Whatever it happens to be, and it doesn't matter as long as it's not extreme, and and you have the inboards all set the same. But what's what I, what I think is important is that you check the pitch before you start, before you even get into the boat. You check the pitch on the oar lock, you check the pitch on the blade. You know that um, because if it's, not, if it's way over pitched or way under pitched, this, this athlete is gonna dig or wash out and, uh, and you're gonna be, in, in, uh, you're gonna be instructing the athlete the entire practice to do something that's impossible that the rigging mm-hmm. doesn't allow. Yeah. So pitch is critical for novices and then and that's before you get in the boat and then get in the boat. And the first thing you do is, is get him in a good finish position. So his hands, the hands are in the finish position. The hands are equal distance from the center of the body. So if, you know, if your inside hand is, and this is, is six skull, inches, sculling for people that are listening, no, it's oh. sweep oh, okay. and sculling. Okay. And, and so think about it. Okay. If you're in the finish position, yeah, yeah. Your hand in a biomechanically effective finish position, whether you have a thin, a narrow grip or a wide grip, mm-hmm. and the more experienced you get, the wider the grip. Okay. Why? Because we push the footsteps into the stern. Now I'm starting to get. Um, but if your hands are eight inches apart and you're, they're at your body, you're looking mm-hmm. down now. So the inside arm is going to form a right angle with the oar. Yeah. Perfect for the leverage of feathering. So the, the finish position, uh, the um, finish position, the footstop setting is the first thing you do when they get in the boat. And um, if they're in sculling, of course, the hands are at the same level and they're, the, and they're your thumbs, the, your thumbs are just touching your body in the finish position, right? They're just, they're not too far away or they're not too cramped up. You wanna be in a good comfortable position. Um, and the next thing you do, or the last thing you might do for novices, is adjust the oarlock height. And you can't do that until you push them off the water. And you have them sit in a finished position with their blades on the water. And the boat is balanced. And if the hands are, are way up by their neck, you're dropping the oarlock. And if they're way down, and if uh, they should be somewhere at the bottom of the sternum. Um, and uh, when the blades are flat on the water, it's almost the same angle of the shaft of the oar when they're bar- when it's squared and buried if they're flat on the water or if it's squared and buried it's almost the same angle down to the water yeah. so those three uh, measurements are the critical ones for um for uh, for novices for the novice crews are they is it pitched are their foots and it's like you said comfortable position where are they in a comfortable position and if their hands are at the right level and they're coming into the body at the, uh, at the same distance from the center line, um, then that's going to be comfortable. As you, as you progress, as you progress, of course, you, then you get into um, the loading, right? And uh, once you're past novice, now you're into the racing. And, uh, and now you're into what we started the, the conversation about was, uh, uh, is the loading correct? Maybe first, uh, is this blade the appropriate blade for my crew? Uh, uh, should I be using a, um, a, a smoothie two 
with my lightweight women who are average 130 pounds and it's a pretty big blade for a little girl um and 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 i generally rig uh the, the size of the blade is is uh related to the the weight of the athlete so you know uh lighter weight athletes can use um the concept two big blades which are actually smaller in size than the smoothie twos or or even and i quite like these uh these new comp blades for um uh for smaller people as well yeah and it's one of the things you know equipment wise you know and when i was building my own program we we had all fat smoothies which was a blade that i came to not really care for um you know, and I wish we'd kind of gone more to the to kind of the standard smoothie or big blade even. Um, and the reason for that, one, in terms of the loading of the ore, but more in terms of the length of the ore, I found that, you know, when the ore gets fatter, you're going to need to bring short the ore, you know, to kind of maintain the load that you need. But there's a lot of value, especially for a lower skilled athlete in terms of a long ore, because a long ore is going to be easier to balance, you know, and so if I'm if I'm able to have, you know, a crew row for with a 370 something centimeter or for, you know, female crew, that's most of what I coach for high school girls and, uh, versus a 362, 363 centimeter, or if it was a fat, um, you know, that's a, that's a big difference. It's a lot easier for them to kind of balance and, and to create handle speed of the blade through the water with that additional leverage on that longer or, you know, is that an observation that kind of holds up with your own experience, you know, in terms of the value of those blades? Yeah, the fat, yeah, the, the big advantage of the fat blade was, um, is a bigger arc, but it's only a bigger arc if you reduce the span. Yeah. So you have to pull the span in if you're using fat blades. And then you have the bigger arc. The load is balanced because, um, the outboard is much shorter, mm -hmm. but the blade connection, the, the, the anchor in the water, the fulcrum is much bigger. So there's a good lock mm -hmm. at the catch. And, um, but without changing the span, uh, using fat two blades is you're not going to have the advantage that they were made for. And, and, and people generally, they use them and they say, I don't, I don't see any difference. I, I don't, but they don't, they don't work with the whole rig. They don't bring in the span, push the stroke to the bow. The real advantage is, is that catch angle of the grader and the load is proportional because the blade short, the oar is shorter, but, but with a bigger arc, now you're getting better connection and you're still getting, um, uh, boat movement, the, the effective stroke length that you have with a longer um smaller blade yeah and um it's one of my few complaints about concept two as a company because i do think it's a superior company both outside of rowing and in is that uh when i would call them and i would talk about you know what's your what do you recommend could, how to rig for these blades and they were like oh just kind of standard you know and i was i knew that was wrong yeah. you know they didn't and i was like well i know that's not right you know what do you mean standard they were like well make it a little shorter I was like, is that it? You just want me to make it a little shorter? And uh, so there wasn't a lot of guidance in it. It always surprised me for a company that was so, you know, eager to kind of push play technology. They weren't equally eager to educate the public on how to use that technology, which drove me crazy. But, uh, but it was interesting throughout the time period, you know, and I, I started that program in 2006 and it, you know, it, uh, it's uh, dissipated in 2018, but uh the, even over that period of time, you know, with all the advances in blades that happened, you know, I would still look at elite rowers at world championships and I'm looking at a lot of top level rowers, you know, using big blades, not even smoothies, but big blades, you know, shaft coming through the front, you know, and just kind of wondering why and realizing as I can kind of progress on my own is just that the, I felt it was very difficult to look at and, and judge the acceleration of the blade in the water and the the dynamic of the interaction of the blade with the puddles and whatnot with a fat blade versus the bigger blade, you know, with a big blade, either a standard or whether a smoothie, you know, in terms of, I felt like the blade was just the more dynamic in the water. 
you know, with those less efficient blade shapes, which is an interesting concept because I think there is such an obsession and I don't know if it's still the case, you know, with the ore manufacturers of making more efficient orders, more, keep it more efficient, you know, and, uh, and actually, I, you know, there's gotta be some point where you're becoming too efficient, right? That, that, that the front end, it's too well connected. There's not enough give, you know, backs are gonna suffer because of that, you know? And another big thing I think that uh, athletes and coaches don't really realize is how important flex is on the ore is that you, that ore must bend. You know, if you have an ore that is not bending in the stroke, you're going to have a very bad time at the release. Um, and I, I do think coaches to this day, they still order ores that are way too stiff for me. I was like, I'd rather have an ore that's a little too soft for my athletes than too stiff for my athletes. And especially coaching high school girls, you know, making sure that we were ordering soft ores all the time or extra soft when they became available. Um, and I'm curious in, in your, in your insights, if you have, you know, similar, you know, I know you were coaching college men for the bulk of your time coaching of what, you know, what the tendencies were, what you felt was more efficient, you know, was it good to kind of get those, those more hydrodynamically efficient ores, or was it good to kind of find an ore that was maybe less efficient, but more functional, more practical and, and kind of how you set that equipment to accommodate yeah, you know, um, we used smoothie twos. I think we tried fat blades uh, a little bit, um, um, and and uh, I was comfortable with the smoothie twos. I, th I think what I think what it is, what's more important is the is the blade work, the connection in the water. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll share a uh, something that I do. Uh, I used to do a lot. I used to park my coach boat and the, the crew would row past. And I would look and in, inevitably the eight rowing by, uh, you're close to one of the puddles and uh, somebody's puddle. Mm -hmm. And you look down and, and the, the blade goes in, it moves around and it comes out and you keep looking down and spread. And it's got to be in the flat water, not in the choppy water in the back. We call it the back bay. Uh, where there's no very low flow and and uh, um, and you can see, so you're looking at this puddle, but it's not a puddle, it's a cavity, and it's not a cavity, it's two cavities, and it's not mm -hmm. two cavities, it's three or four or five cavities, and they're all swirling around each other, and and you see, wow, what is happening there? And then you look at the blade work again, and and. And, and you think about what's the dynamics of this blade action with the water. So the blade goes in and if it's really good blade work, blade will go in and it's, and the load is correct. Blade will go in, it moves away from the boat, moves back to the boat. And on the way away, the water comes off the back end of the blade. And when it comes back to the boat in the last half of the stroke, the water will, will form a cavity off the tip. And really nice blade work has two cavities that sort of dance around each other. What happens though, is that if the blade goes in and you start to pull and you start to go deep, the top edge of the blade will form a cavity. And when the blade comes shallow, the bottom edge of the blade will form a cavity. So anytime the blade goes vertical in the water, the, the top or bottom edge will be a, an edge of, um, of um, 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 I want to say resistance, but I, I can't think of the term. And, and you'll see that um, ineffective blade work has a lot of different cavities. And uh, it would be interesting for your coaches that stop your coach boat, watch the boat go by in flat water, in dead flat water, and then say, is Am I being effective? Is this blade effective as uh, as a as a fulcrum, as a propeller, or is it um, ineffective because it's just moving up and down and through the water, creating all these uh, um, creating all these cavities, which is which is a sign of ineffective blade work. So the ideal is looking for the two, you know, yes. bow tip and bow tip and boat work, boat side tip. And yes. anything more than that is an indication of inefficiency. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, you know, my next question is kind of, 
looking at the different aspects of, of rigging and what they're, what they're affecting, you know, just kind of a summary so people understand inboard, outboard, span, pitch, uh, stretch position, foot stretcher angle, heel height. You know, can we run through each of those and just kind of, you know, just kind of for people listening, the you know, less experienced, maybe the more experienced and just what, what are the effects or lack of effect that each of those have and, and changing and whether you change it one direction or another, what's, what's happening, you know, maybe, maybe starting with span and spread, you know, I think, I think maybe people don't understand that as much as they should. Sure. Well, maybe I can break it down uh, in a different way, but um, so we have um, dimensions uh, for biomechanical effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Then we have dimensions that help hydrodynamic effectiveness and biomechanical being uh, um Foot stretcher position, for example, or does it allow you to come into the finish uh, in the ideal uh, position where you're biomechanically most effective to apply power or through the entire stroke for that matter? Yep. Hydrodynamic effectiveness uh, is pitch and maybe or lock height, which is also biomechanical. Uh, but pitch is the, is the blade connecting with the water or do you need vertical pressure to keep it buried or uh, um, to stop it from going too deep. And then the last, um, uh, and really the meat of rigging is length and load, and you can't separate one from the other. And, uh, and that is, and those are, that's giving you drive time and stroke length, effective stroke length, um, load, uh, and stroke position, uh, are giving you blade slip connection, whether where the blade's moving through the water or whether it's not. So those are three sort of different areas. And biomechanical, of course, um, is also uh, things like foot stretcher angles, foot stretcher height. Um, are you are you effective uh, with this foot stop angle, with this foot stop splay and this heel separation? Um, and then um, um, and is it comfortable? And that's what we, you know, comfort. You're, you're sending a guy to work for an hour and a half. And if he's not in a comfortable position for that hour and a half that he's out there working, mm -hmm. how, how soon will he break down? And the more, more comfort he is, the longer and, and more effective his training will be. Right. So um, if you want to go back to um, um, and start with span, um, I always say rigging charts are great. And because the alternative to using rigging charts is not to rig at all. Just, just use the boat the same way it was set up last year. I don't have to check it. And so uh, that's why rigging charts work because it makes you check the boat. Um, but beyond that, it gives you a place to start. Beyond that, um, um, your oar length, uh, inboard, outboard, your blade size and the um, span will affect the the load and the length of your and the length of your stroke. And what we're targeting there is um, um, drive time and stroke length, effective stroke length. And uh, and then um, um, so I don't know if I if you want to. I don't know if we can break it down more. What are kind of, you know, kind of numbers, what are the, what are typical ranges and, and where do people tend to fall within those ranges? And so, you know, let's say if we were looking at a, a spread, say somewhere between, you know, maybe 82 and 87, you know, maybe kind of I've seen is, you know, is that what you've seen? What are those numbers kind of, what are the ranges that you, that you'll tend to be as normal and how to know where you might fall within that range? Yeah, and, and it's kind of different for different speeds of boats, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, 82, uh, yeah, with, certainly with fat twos, uh, but um, um, typical smoothie two blades, um, you're looking at, you know, heavyweight crews from 83 to, um, and if you're in the pairs, you're out to 87 mm -hmm. uh, centimeters, uh, something like that. Um but it, it all depends on the um, on the crew itself. Uh, what what is your power, and 
how long, how much are you big, tall, uh, flexible crew, or are you short, strong crew? And um, and these are two different rigs for the same, um, let's say, the, our same varsity eight. Yeah. I, these this these guys are really tall and long, um, but they're this year the erg score is just above six minutes. But in my varsity eight, I got these little guys, strong and um, oh, I forgot I want to say mesomorphs, but um, and they're just. Uh, um, really powerful you can put they can all go sub 550 uh and and so that's an entirely different rig and what i found out recently through my research with uh custom rigging is that um a big part of it is the athlete weight itself if you're a very if you're heavier you're going to need a lighter load a lighter load span wise outboard wise um because you have to accelerate a greater uh, mass during the drive. I, uh, I do that custom rigging uh, with fluid design and, uh, and then we follow up with, um, with uh, uh, video analysis. And in 2019, when we started, I started getting video back from the customers and um, I did the analysis and I was finding that the lightweights that I had rigged their drive times were, were most of them, the majority of them were too low. And I looked at that and thought, I'm accounting for all these measurements. There's 20 different measurements that I get when I'm doing custom rigging. And I'm calculating a low an, a span and outboard and inboard, um, stroke position, everything. They rig the boat, give it to the customer. The customer takes the video and comes back to me and the, the, uh, the rigging I had recommended was way too light. And, uh, and I quickly realized after 10 or 12 people who had drive times in the low 70s or less, why did they have those drive times in the low 70s? Because I wasn't accounting for their body weight. They can easily, they can, I was accounting for their power because yeah. they give me the ERG score. When I do custom rigging, I know their erg score. I know the length of their stroke. I, I know everything about them. What I wasn't, and I did know their body weight, but I didn't account for it in my calculations. And uh, so I quickly made that adjustment. And, um, and I don't know if, if we realize that as coaches, uh, that, yeah, I, uh, I, we generally, we know we got to rig lightweights different from heavyweights. Uh, but it, it really hit me when I was rigging, and then we're mostly masters, um, rigging the, these people, not accounting for their weight, and then saying, going back and saying, wow, we really need to rig lightweights heavier than we rig uh, um, heavyweights it, it, with proportional power, um, like erg scores, because the lightweights don't have that mass to move. They, they can pick up the catch. And, uh, and certainly when you look at their, um, their speed curves, they can accelerate the boat uh, to a greater extent uh, between um, full reach and, and finish uh, than heavyweights. The heavyweights can maintain the speed on the recovery, uh, where the lightweights don't have the mass to, to accelerate the boat on the recovery. Yeah, and I and I don't know now if I'm getting into too going to deviating from rigging, but um, weight, body weight is a major consideration when, uh, along with power and stroke length, it, uh, when you're when you're looking at what your rigging should be. And I'm curious. I've had I've heard a lot of reports um, from heavier rowers, elite heavier rowers. You know communicating a preference to rowing in a shell size that was too small versus a shell size that may necessarily have built for them or certainly too big. I don't know if anybody likes to row in a shell that's too big for them. Is there anything to that of kind of, you know, maybe overloading, overloading a hull, getting a little bit more wetted surface than it was designed for and just jacking up the heights to accommodate for that, you know, in kind of your boat speed analysis, you know, is that something that you've seen? 
Well, I'll tell you what I am looking at. And what I did look at uh, uh, is, um, and it relates to the size of the boat, but what's a big factor is the trim and the trim change. Mm -hmm. How much the trim will change um, uh, through the drive. I looked at the pairs uh, in uh, 2019 uh, and when I did the video analysis and it's on my Facebook, I think posted probably last year or the year before, but I looked at the speed curves of all the pairs and at the finish, um, the speed, uh, slows the, 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 uh, acceleration goes below zero, goes into negative acceleration for that part of the finish, probably a 10th. A tenth of a stroke, around a tenth of a stroke, uh, a tenth of a second, rather, and uh, and all the pairs, except for two, all the pairs, the speed was reduced, lost um, one or two tenth uh, uh, meters per second. In the two pairs that were able to maintain speed through the release, uh, those were the pairs that never went into negative trim. So I'm measuring the, the bow out of the water and the stern out of the water at the catch position, at the finish position, and then again at the catch position. And if we draw a line along the freeboard from, uh, and uh, what we found is that, what I found is that all the pairs that went bow down lost speed. Hmm. My speculation is that the, when the bow goes down, the uh, wave propagation is huge. Uh, and we, we know that, right? And when you right. get to the finish of the stroke, the, the waves really, it really displaces water. The boats that didn't um, go bow down, and now it's New Zealand, and I think Spain, maintain that speed, and they stayed uh, with positive trim. The bow never went below the stern. The bow never went lower in the water than the stern. Okay. And so trim, I believe, is a big uh, factor. And, and boat builders know this. Uh, they, they've, they've done calculations. On it. They've done resistance measurements on their boats uh, at different trim levels. Mm -hmm. And they know that um, um, if that trim, and, and, and they'll tell you, I know that uh, 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 boat builders have told me, yeah, it definitely is a uh, bigger resistance at uh, lesser trim angles. That's interesting. So if you're, so if the boat's level, you know, we don't want it to kind of evenly rock back and forth from level. We want it to kind of emphasize, you know, the bow coming higher than level, but never dropping lower than level. So I believe that's true. Travis. I believe that's true. I would, uh, um, I would also say that the boat builders have already done these calculations mm -hmm. and these measurements and uh, in in tanks and wet tanks right with their whole designs yep. and they could they could tell you um what i've seen what we've seen in at 2019 uh with those crews uh were um and packers and uh, felipe's um basically um that were that when they that appeared when they went into negative trim, the boat slowed. Now the boat's going to slow as well from technique, right? So it could right, be a little right. bit of technique. I just don't, I don't want to put it all on trim, but you asked about, uh, um, you asked about it, about, uh, um, and so that's important, I, I think. And I look at that when I look at videos now, of people mm -hmm. that I custom rig, I check their, I check to see that they're not too far to the bow and the rigor and, and foot stomps aren't too far to the bow that they go into that negative trim state. Well, it sounds like convincing data because you're saying that e that every boat that had the bow dip uh, below the stern had that uh, negative yeah. acceleration and uh, and the two boats that were maintained positive acceleration. Were, were those two boats that maintained positive acceleration, were those the faster boats in the race? Uh, I think the, I think the uh, Spain came fifth. I want to say New Zealand came first or second okay all right i should remember that i've been to so many regattas i'm losing it <laughs> no no i think that's a lot of data to remember <laughs> whenever uh you know one thing i always talk to my athletes when they always get like obsessed about a race like the heather charles is a big one you know they're like oh yes heather charles is so important i gotta be ready i was like 
you know, who, you know, let's say it's a varsity girl. I was like, who won the, who won the youth girls aid event two years ago? Like, I, I don't know. It's like, I was like, nobody knows. Nobody cares. <laughs> you know, it's not as, <laughs> it's not as important as you think it is. Like, you know, you might be able to say who won the Super Bowl a year or two ago, but you know, nobody's going to be like, oh yeah, you know, Marin won, you know, you know, this year, nobody knows. It's, it's not as important as the, as they think, but uh, yeah. Well, we're coming up on two hours, you know, and uh, you know, so I don't want, you know, our uh, audience turning into pumpkins here. Uh, I really appreciate your time, Mike. Can you tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about perseverance, you know, for those listening, it's uh purser P U R C E R perseverance. You know, I like that name by the way, uh, perseverance dot, <laughs> dot C A for uh, Canada. And then you can also find rowing perseverance on Facebook. You know, Mike, can you talk to us a little bit about the specific work you're doing there? So people that are interested in kind of looking you up and taking advantage of those services. Uh, yes. Uh, and I, and I want to tell you, uh, that the name came about, about, uh, 10 years ago when I was coaching lightweights and, um, the, uh, it was a, it was a, uh, um, uh, a very, um, my, my phone, well, um, hmm. oh, she's got it. Um, uh, it was a, it was a very tough workout in the summer. And, uh, one of those where you're just trying to to push the limits like two weeks before the taper or before the taper. And uh, the Coxie tweeted out at the end of the workout, at the end of the day, uh, the crew needed real perseverance today. <laughs> and, uh, and then it, it sort of stuck around when, the, yeah. when you needed the perseverance uh, um, to get through one of my workouts. Um, but the, the company I started a few years ago, because I, I do want to help coaches and I want to help athletes. And, uh, it started with um, with just doing the analysis. The analysis I started over ten years ago. The rigging analysis I started over ten years ago, and uh, where I was measuring blade slip, measuring and trying to quantify movement of the boat or movement of the boat based on uh, and measure movement of the boat. And the and the six factors that I measure are uh, drive time, blade slip. Um, uh, effective stroke length, stroke position, rate, and ratio. And from those factors, I can make recommendations that can help you, uh, based on the numbers, uh, help you improve that rigging, um, uh, make the adjustments. Um, and then, uh, and, and, and I do it. And then I, it, it morphed into custom rigging, working with the fluid design boat building uh, company that uh, came to me and said, we want to we wanna do a sort of bike fit for um, people buying singles. And uh, I measure a lot of athletes. I used athletes at Brock University, measure a lot of uh, athletes at my um, master's camps and at the other camps. And I came up and we linked, we took a lot of measurements, 20 different measurements, plus your ERG score and, and, uh, and then uh, and put those into uh, some formulas to help figure out what the, um, best rigging would be for, for your, for you based on all these measurements. And, and then we follow up with a, with analysis. Uh, once you get into the new boat, once uh, an analysis of your, uh, of your stroke. And, um, and now we do quite a bit of uh, custom rigging, uh, for people that, that don't know where should I start? Um, there's so many different and I, and I have uh, athletes come and say, oh, I should row uh, with uh, uh, 287 oars, 87 uh, inboard, and 160. I said, why? It's pretty heavy. Well, because that's, uh, I'm in this category. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I say, no, no, no. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I'm doing in, in rigging, uh, Travis. In, in the boat, uh, in the uh, sort of uh, technique analysis part of it, uh, it's, sort of uh, uh it's measure, getting video measuring your boat speed your acceleration and then analyzing all the different parts of the stroke all the movements you do and how they affect the boat speed and and from my work with uh um from my analysis at the world championships and comparing the analysis with the finish positions I've begun, and I can, it's not enough data uh, yet, but I'm 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 beginning to uh, believe 
that there's certain movements that are performance factors. And, and any coach will tell you this. And, and the things like I measure how long between full reach and when the blade is fully buried. And when I put that data together uh, from the world championships, guess what? It, the quicker you can put the blade in the water, the better chance you have uh, performing well. The top crews put the blade in faster. Mm -hmm. uh, top crews have uh, uh, more acceleration on the recovery. Top crews have less deceleration time on their recovery, and all the all the um, the uh, um, technique factors that uh, I measure can what I I can measure them. I measure them and, and go back to the athlete and say, here, here, and here are three big opportunities, and I show them the curve and I said, look, coming into the coming into the finish, your acceleration slows way too soon. So this is what we this is what we should do to yep. maintain acceleration right to the finish, or uh, at the catch, um, or maybe on the uh, on the recovery. They're not learning dynamic recovery, and this is common in masters, right? Because they learned hands away, pivot forward, go up the slide, and then they go and they slow down way too soon, way too soon, and the boat starts to decelerate way too soon, and that deceleration. We teach, we teach them to try and use that dynamic recovery in practice. So that's, a, that's been a big, that's really interesting. And I do a number of uh, analysis every week from people that send me videos. So that's, that's a really interesting part of my uh, uh, business right now is doing analysis and the custom rigging. Yeah, I'm having fun. I'm having fun. Definitely. Well, I know that, uh, you know, as most people that learned in big boats, never fully appreciated rigging until I was training in a single a lot. And I was like, wow, you know, I went one day from Joe Schmo to you know, the next day I was Rob Waddell and uh, just by making the right change to my rigging. And so, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's definitely something that's uh, there. I, you know, it's uh, as a coach, when I was coaching the bigger crews, it was always more frustrating because I couldn't play with it as much. But when mm -hmm. I, you know, coach small groups of scholars in the summer, you know, we were changing, changing everything almost every day, you know, certainly changing it between single double quad and, you know, and it really made a big difference there. So, uh, so I encourage everyone listening, you know, take advantage of the services, you know, it's uh, the right rig really makes a difference. You could be Rob Waddell too, or, uh, <laughs> you know, out there, people even remember Rob, uh, from back in the day, I guess I'm getting old. I'm dating myself, but, uh, but yeah, uh, just so, to be effective with whatever you have, you just yeah. want to be effective with whatever you have. Definitely. And enjoy it. Cause, uh, certainly uh, a good rig is enjoyable regardless of what speed you're going. But uh, thanks again, Mike. I really appreciate it. So that's uh, perseverance.ca. I'll put that link in the description uh, for the video and uh, for the podcast here. And then if you search Rowing Perseverance on Facebook, uh, Mike also has a page there and he posts some, starts some very, very in-depth, fascinating discussions about uh, video analysis and technique. So uh, definitely check those out. And for my own, uh, you can find me at gtsrowing.com or you can find on YouTube, just search uh, my name, Travis Gardner. Lots of, uh, lots of me sitting there talking about training methodology, but uh, hopefully this has helped you guys. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mike, for- uh, Thank you, Travis. Thank you very much. Your time. Your... And it's been a fun conversation, but uh, thanks again. We'll catch you on the next episode. Great. Bye.